from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thanks everyone for coming out here today um, to the Library of Congress. My name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here. And I would like to welcome you to our uh, second Asian American Literature Today series. Uh, the first with uh, a fiction writer uh, featuring uh, Yi Yen Lee. Uh, we launched this series last spring as an extension of the library's long running Asian American Poetry Today series. And we were thrilled to begin with Bangladeshi American poet, Tarfia Faizula. Uh, I would like to thank former library staffer, Rame Grafalda, for developing this, this uh, series and uh, working with uh, us to expand it and um, for including the Poetry and Literature Center. I'd also like to thank our presenting partners, uh, the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, the Asian American Literary Review, and the Asian American Studies Program at the University of Maryland and specifically Terry Hong and Lawrence Min Davis for helping us uh, continue to champion Asian American writers and for including fiction in that mix. Finally, this event would not be possible without the behind the scenes support of the Library of Congress Asian American Association, a staff organization that sponsors events and activities related, related to Asian Pacific American heritage in the library community. The association was founded in 1994 and is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. It has helped develop and promote today's event as part of its cele ongoing celebration of Asian American writers. Uh, specifically, I would like to thank Wendy Maloney and Kelly Uzawa over there uh, for helping put this series together and connecting us to our presenting partners. Kelly and Wendy, much, much thanks. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to ask you to do what I did uh, right before I stepped up here, which is to turn off your cell phones and any other electronic devices you have that might interfere with this event. Uh, second note that this program is being videotaped for webcast on the library's website. And by participating in the question and answer period, you give us permission for future use of the recordings. Finally, let me tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center. We are home to the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, and we put on readings, lectures, and panels of all sorts throughout the year. If you would like to find out more about literary events uh, here at the Library of Congress, please uh, check out uh, our, our list of events in the foyer, and you can sign our sign-up sheet out there. You can also check our website, www. Uh, slash dot dot lsc dot gov slash poetry. And now on to today's event. Uh, Yi and Lee will read for approximately 25 minutes and uh, we will follow with a moderated discussion with Lawrence Min Davis. You can read more about, about our featured reader in the print program that you should have. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit more about our uh, moderator. He is the founding director and current editor-in-chief of the Asian American Literary Review and is overseeing development of its global digital education project, the Mixed Race Initiative. He is also a consultant with the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. Since 2005, he has taught Asian American literature, Asian American film, and mixed race studies for the Asian American Studies Program at the University of Maryland. Please join me in welcoming Lawrence Moon Davis. Hello, and thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you to Rob and to the Poetry and Literature Center. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker today. Uh, Who Done It? is the opening frame for Yoon Lee's latest novel, Kinder Than Solitude, nominally about which of three childhood friends may have poisoned a fourth into semi-catatonia. But as we look back with them from present day China and present day America and slowly unravel what happened, including the backdrop of the Tiananmen Square massacre, the question gradually transmutes into why done it? And both questions perhaps fall away eventually in favor of other existential questions. 
Why are people good? Or rather, why social conscience? How do social upheaval and migration change people and places and upend what it means to be good or kind? A, no a novel that Salman Rushdie calls exceptional. He also calls Yoon Lee one of our major novelists. Kinder Than Solitude is a meditation on solitude and distance and how and why we try and fail to un understand one another. It is also a brilliantly counterintuitive reframing of immigration, turning us away from our well-worn grooves of understanding, away from simply grappling with Americanness, away from our other standard metrics of assimilation and immigration, financial survival, cultural loss and preservation, legal and social discrimination, to something more elemental, what migrants carry with them. In Kinder Than Solitude, what they carry is the nightmare of history, of their disorienting childhoods, Tiananmen Square and the flattening of dissent, the unwavering vision that one of them, Ruyu, must make it to America, though why remains a mystery. And linked, this mysterious, inexplicable act of violence, the poisoning, unless who done it or why, then finally, the act is symptomatic of the great solitude of our age, of upheaval and migration and survival. Yoon Lee is the author of two collections of stories, A Thousand Years of Good Prayers and The Gold Boy, Emerald Girl, and two novels, The Vagrants and, most recently, Kinder Than Solitude. She was a 2010 MacArthur Foundation Fellow, named one of Granta's 21 Best Young American Novelists, and one of the New Yorker's top 20 writers under 40. Please join me in welcoming Yoon Lee. Good afternoon, and thank you, Rob, and thank you, Lawrence, for that beautiful introduction, and thank you for coming. And I think I'm going to read you two short excerpts. Is it too tall? Okay, that's much better. Thank you. I think I'm going to read you two short excerpts from this novel, Kinder Than Solitude, and both excerpts will be taken from present day. As Lawrence explained, a poisoning happened 20, 30, 21 years ago, and so I'm going to read the opening chapter. The woman who was poisoned 21 years ago in 1989, she died in the opening page. And a man whose name is Bo Yan, who you're going to hear about, he took care of her for 21 years until her death. And on this day, he cremated her and he sent his ash, he sent her ash to her mother and he went home to his own mother's house for dinner. And I, as I always say, we always go home to dinner. So this is the dinner. The topics at dinner were his sister's American born twins. The real estate prices in Beijing and in a coastal city where his parents were pondering purchasing a waterfront condo and the inefficiency of their new housekeeper. Only when his mother had cleaned away the dishes did she ask, as though grasping a passing thought, if Bo Yang had heard of Xiao Wei's death. By then his father had gone into his study. So I heard, Bo Yang said. His mother returned from the kitchen with two cups of tea and passed one to him. He cringed at her nudging the conversation beyond the comfortable repertoire of their Euro topics. He showed up whenever she summoned him. The best way to stay distanced, he believed, was to satisfy her every need. What do you think then? His mother said. Think of what? The whole thing, she said. One must acknowledge the waste, no? What waste? Shall I slide, obviously, his mother said, adjusting a single calla lily in a crystal vase on the dinner table. But even if you take her out of the equation, others' lives have been affected. What others, Bu Yang wanted to say to his mother, would be worth a moment of her thought. 
The chemical found in Shao Ai's blood had been taken from his mother's laboratory. Whether it had been an attempted murder, an, un an unsuccessful suicide, or a freak accident had never been determined. His family did not talk about the case, but Boyan knew that his mother had never let go of her grudge. Do you mean your career went to waste? Boyan asked. After the incident, the university had taken disciplinary action against his mother for, his, for her mismanagement of chemical. It would have been an unpleasant incident, a small glitch in her otherwise stellar academic career, but she insisted on disputing the charge. Every laboratory in the department was run according to outdated regulations, with chemicals available to all graduate students. It was a misfortune that a life had been destroyed, she admitted. She was willing to be punished for allowing three teenage children to be in her lab unsupervised, a mismanagement of human beings rather than chemicals. If you want to look at my career, sure, that's gone to waste for no reason. But things have turned out okay for you, Boyan said, better, you have to admit. His mother had left the university and joined a pharmaceutical company, later purchased by an American company. With her flawless English, which she had learned at a Catholic school, and several patents to her name, she earned an income three times what she would have made as a professor. But did I say I was talking about myself, she said. Your assumption that I have only myself to think of is only a hypothesis, not a proven fact. I don't see anyone else worthy of your thought. Not even you? What do you mean? You don't feel your life has been affected by Shao Ai's poisoning? What answer did she want to hear, Boyan thought. You get used to something like that, he said. On second thought, he added, no, I wouldn't say her case has affected me in any substantial way. Who wanted her to die? Excuse me? You heard me right. Who wanted to kill her back then? She didn't seem like someone who'd commit suicide, though certainly one of your little girlfriends, I can't remember which one, hinted at that. In rehearsing scenarios of Shao Ai's death, Boyan had never included his mother, but one does any parent hold a position in the child's fantasy. Still, that his mother had paid attention and that he had underestimated her awareness of the case annoyed him. I'm sure you understand that if, in all honesty, you tell me that you were the one who poisoned her, I wouldn't say or do anything, she said. This conversation is purely for my curiosity. I didn't poison her, Boyan said, I'm sorry. Why sorry? You'd be much happier to have an answer. I would be happier too if I could tell you for sure who poisoned her. Well then, there are only two other ops there are only two other possibilities. So, do you think it was Moran or Ruyu? He had asked himself the question over the years. He looked at his mother with a smile careful that his face not betray him. What do you think? I didn't know either of them. There was no reason for you to know them, Boyan said, or for that matter, anyone. His mother ignored his sarcasm. I never really met Ruyu, she said. Moran, of course, I saw around, but I don't remember her well. I don't recall her being brilliant, am I right? I doubt there's anyone brilliant enough for you. Your sister is, Boyan's mother said, but don't distract me. You used to know them both well, so you must have an idea. I don't, Boyan said. His mother looked at him, rearranging he imagined 
his and the other people's positions in her head, as she would do with chemical molecules. He remembered taking his parents to America to celebrate their 40th wedding anniversary. At the airport in San Francisco, they had seen an exhibition of duck decoys. Despite the 12-hour flight, his mother had studied each of the wooden ducks. The colors and shapes of the different decoy products fascinated her. And she read the old 1920s posters advertising 20-cent duck decoys using her knowledge of inflation rates over the years to calculate how much each duck would cost today. Always so curious, Boyan thought. So impersonally curious. Did you ever ask them, she said now, whether one of them tried to murder someone? Boyan said, no. Why not? I think you are overestimating your sensibility. But do you not want to know? Why not ask them? When? Back then or now? Why not ask now? They may be honest with you now that Shawai is dead. For one thing, Boyan thought, neither Moran nor Rui would answer his email. If you are not overestimating my ability, you're certainly overestimating people's desire for honesty, he said. But has it occurred to you? It might have only been an accident. Would that be too dull for you? His mother looked into her tea. If I put too many tea leaves in the teapot, that could be considered an accident, a mistake. No one puts poison into another person's teacup by accident. What do you mean that Moran or Rui was the real target and poor Shao Ai happened to take the wrong tea? To think, it could have been you. My drinking the poison by accident? No, what I'm asking is, what do you think of the possibility of someone trying to murder you? The single calla lily, his mother's favorite flower, looked menacing unreal with its flawless curve. She blew lightly over her tea, not looking at him, though he knew that was part of her scrutiny. Was she distorting the past to humor herself? Or was she revealing her doubt? Or was the line between distorting and revealing so fine that one could not happen without the other? For all he knew, he had lived in her selective unawareness, but perhaps this was only an illusion. One would not to have the last word about one's own mother. He admitted that the thought had never occurred to him. It's a possibility, you know, she said. But why would, but why would anyone have wanted to kill me? Why would anyone want to kill anyone, she said. And right away, Boyan knew that he had spoken too carelessly. If someone steals poison from a lab, that person intends to do harm to another person or to herself. For all I know, the harm was already done the moment that the chemical was stolen. And I'm not asking you why. Why anyone does anything is beyond my understanding or interest. All I would like to know is who was trying to kill who. But unfortunately, you don't have an answer. And sadly, you don't seem to share my curiosity. So that's one dinner done. That's a very difficult dinner. <laughs> and I'm going to read the second dinner, which is not a dinner, it's a book club in California. So it's again present day. So this is another character, Ru Yu, who was one of the three childhood friends. And on this day, she got an email saying Shao Ai died. And she was going to, to a friend's house. Celia's message on Ru Yu's voicemail sounded panic, as though Celia had been caught in a tornado. But Ru Yu found little surprise in the emergency. That evening was Celia's turn to host ladies' night. 
These monthly get-togethers had started as a book club, but as more books went unfinished and undiscussed, other activities had been introduced, wine tasting, tea tasting, a question and answer session with the president of local real estate agency. When the market turned downward, a holiday workshop on homemade soaps and candles. Rui wondered if the florist had misinterpreted the color theme Celia had requested, or if the caterer, a new one she was trying out upon a friend's recommendation, had failed to meet her ex expectation. In either case, Rui's presence was urgently needed. Could she please come early, Celia had said in the voicemail, pretty please? Not, of course, to right any wrong, but to wear witness to Celia's personal tornado. Being let down was Celia's fate. Life never failed to bestow upon her pain and disappointment she had to suffer on everyone's behalf, so that the world could go on being a good place free from real calamities. Celia's martyrdom, in most people's less than kind opinion, amounted to nothing but a dramatic self-centeredness. But Rui, one of the very few who took Celia's sacrifice seriously, understood the source of her suffering. Celia, though lapsed, had been brought up by Catholic parents. Edwin and the boys were out to dinner and to a warrior game, Celia told Rui when she arrived at the Moorlands. A robin had flown into the window that morning, knocking itself out and setting out an alarm, Celia said. And thank goodness the window was not broken, and Louise, the gardener, was here to take care of the poor bird. The caterer was 17 minutes late, so wasn't it wise of her to have changed the delivery time to half an hour earlier? In the middle of recounting an exchange between the delivery man and herself, Celia stopped abruptly. Ruby, she said, Ruby. Yes, Ruby said, I'm listening. Celia came and sat down with Ruby in the breakfast nook. The table and the benches were made of wood reclaimed from an old Kensington bar, where Celia's grandmother, she liked to tell her visitors, used to go for writing lessons. You look distracted, Celia said, pushing a glass of water towards Rui. The woman Celia thought of as Ruby should have unwavering attention as an audience. Rui thanked Celia for the water and said that nothing was really distracting her. To Celia's circle of friends, many of whom would arrive soon, Rui was, depending on what was needed, a woman of many possibilities, a Mandarin tutor, a reliable house and pet sitter, a last minute babysitter, a part time cashier at a confection boutique, an occasional party helper. But her loyalty, first and foremost, belonged to Celia, for it was her, for it was she who had found Rui these many opportunities. Celia did not often notice anything beyond her immediate preoccupation, but sometimes distraught, she was able to perceive other people's moods. In those moments, she adamantly required an explanation, as though her tenacious urge to know someone else's suffering offered a way out of her own. Rui wondered whether she looked disturbed and wish she had touched up her face before entering the house. You are not yourself today, Celia said. Don't tell me you had a tough day. The day is already hard enough for me. Here's what I've done today, Rui said. I was in the shop in the morning. I stopped at the dry cleaners. I fed Karen's cat. I took a walk. Now tell me how hard my day could be. Celia sighed and said that of course Rui was right. You don't know how I envy you. Rui had been told this often, and once in a while, she almost believed Celia to be sincere. You sounded dreadful in your voicemail, Rui said. What happened? What happened, Celia said, was pure outrage. She went away and came back with a pair of white t-shirts. 
Earlier that afternoon, she had attended a meeting for the fundraising of a major art festival in San Francisco. And on the committee was a writer whose teen detective mysteries were recent bestsellers. You would think it's not too much to ask a writer to sign a couple of t-shirts for his fans, Celia said. You would think any decent man would have more respect than this. She dropped the t-shirt on Ruyu's lap and Ruyu spread them on the table. In black permanent marker and block letters, the writers had written, to Jake, a future orphan, and to Lucas, a future orphan, followed by his unrecognizable signature. Perhaps the writer had only meant it as a joke, a sabotaging wink to the boys behind their mother's back. Or else it had been more than a joke, and he had felt caught to reveal an absolute truth that a child did not learn from his parents. Unacceptable, Ruby said, and folded up the shirts. Now what do I do with them? I promised the boys I would get them his signature. How do I explain to them that this person they admire is a jerk? An asshole, really, Celia said, and gulped down some wine as if to rinse away the bad taste. Thank goodness Edwin picked them up from school so I didn't have to deal with this until later. Poor, gullible Celia, believing, like most people, in a moment caught later. Safely removed, later promises, possibilities, changes, solutions, rewards, happiness, all too distant to be real, yet real enough to offer relief from the claustrophobic cocoon of now. If only Celia had the strength to be both kind enough and harsh enough with herself to stop talking about later, that heartless annihilator of now. Exactly what, Rui said, will you say to them later? That I forgot, Celia said uncertainly. What else can I say? Better for your children to be annoyed with you, better for your husband to be disappointed by you than to break anyone's heart. I'll tell you, Ruby, it's smart of you not to have children, smarter of you to not want another husband. Stay where you are. Sometimes I think about how simple and beautiful your life is, and that, I say to myself, is how a woman should treat herself. Had Celia been a different person, Rui might have found her words distasteful, malicious even. But Celia, being Celia, and never doubting the truth of her own words, was as close to a friend as Rui would admit into her life. She unfolded the shirts and studied the handwriting, and asked Celia if she had another pair of t-shirts. Why? Celia said. And Rui said that they might as well fix the problem themselves. You don't mean it, Celia said, and Rui replied that indeed she did. What's wrong with borrowing the writer's name and making two boys happy? Celia hesitantly offered another set of t-shirts, and Rui asked Celia what messages she wanted her children to wear to school. Are you sure this is the right thing to do? I don't want my children to think I lied to them. The writer, Rui, wanted to remind Celia, had not lied. I'm, not the one, I'm the one lying here, she said. Look away. What if the other kids at school realize that the signatures are fake? Is it even legal to do this? There are worse crimes, Rui said. I'm going to say, <laughs> I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Two 
passages that you, or the two sections that you chose to read, um, kind of helpfully indicative of the larger novel where we are in the present and thinking back to the past and we're moving across space. We're in China in the first and the second we're in the US. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about how you conceptualize the novel as it, because it moves so much between space and time, mm -hmm. how, how you um, began to think your way through it and how it came together. Yes, I loved it now. I, I, I did think a lot about the structure of the novel. Partly, I think, the, as you said, there's the time. There's 1989, 2010, time, 2010. There are two time points in the novel. There are also two places, America and China. And, and so I think to figure out that structure, it took me two years of not writing to figure out that structure. I knew the story. I did not know how to structure the story. So I had quite a few structures in my mind. The first structure was I was going to write a linear novel. So 1989 was the first part, and 2010 was the second part. And as I think the problem with that structure is by the middle of the novel, you would know what happened with the poisoning. The mystery was you know, resolved in the midpoint of the novel. And I did not want to lose that, so I thought that did not work. And the second structure I thought of was past, present, and past. Wait, sorry, present, past, and present. So 2010 and 89, 2010. So again, I think that structure, I could not avoid the problem of revealing who killed whom <laughs> by the two thirds of the novel. And, and in fact, I was writing and I was thinking about it. The characters actually, they were very young. When they were 16 when this poisoning happened. They themselves did not know what happened more than we readers would know. So I think the structure would work the best if the readers and the characters find out what happened on the same page. And for that, I decided to do the alternating past, present, and each chapter, you know, going past 89 and 2010. So towards the end of the novel, I think at least one of the characters found out what happened. And that was when we also found out what happened. It, so along those same lines, um, I'm thinking, starting off in the present and then moving back and forth. Another thing that gets hidden besides the murder is uh, is Tiananmen Square, and yeah. not so much the massacre, but the aftermath and how, especially the young people are thinking about it in their families. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering about that also is something that's sort of buried, mm -hmm. whereas um, you know that may be front and center for some kind of writer's interest, like that this is a book about that political right. moment and its aftermath. And then I wonder about um, how you're thinking about it and why it occupies the kind of space it does in the mm -hmm. characters' lives and how it is hidden to some degree. I mean, it's very much a part of the novel, but it's not something right. we encounter from the beginning, certainly. Right. You know, part of it is I did not conceive this as a political novel, and I never think of myself as a politi political writer, but I am very curious about people and characters' lives, you know, during a political upheaval. And if you look at recent Chinese history, Tiananmen Square was one big event for the, the country and also for these characters. They were 16 and that was the turning point of their life. They, 16, they were between children and grown-ups. And when Tiananmen Square happened and when the poisoning happened, they were no longer children. So. I think that was important in my thinking. And the other thing I thought was interesting is Tiananmen Square was very much on my mind when I was writing the book. But all three characters who survived this poisoning, they never mentioned Tiananmen Square to themselves, to anybody else. And I think it's interesting to me these characters have this active will to negate that memory. They don't want to admit that thing happened. And I, I do believe you can write about something with the negative space. And so I think Tiananmen Square, the whole political history is the negative space of the novel. And the novel doesn't have to focus on that. But 
I think they are not talking about it as their way to talk about it. Mm -hmm. There's a, the, the idea of negative space brings to mind another aspect. Which, so in the second portion you read, Ryu and Celia are interacting, and, Ru and Celia plays a role later on in the novel, and there's like this, this isn't a, like a major spoiler, like who killed who poos into, but like there's this portion later where Celia starts imagining how Ryu got to the US and like comes up with these kind of wild immigration scenarios as opposed to like married someone and got a green card and came over or like came over to work or to came over to study. It's like is like the mistress of a super powerful person and has been stashed here and like comes up like and reject and is like pushes against mm -hmm. Ryu's attempts to be like, well I might be a little bit, you know, less exotic than that. And so that is like um, this kind of sort of flare up of Americanness. Like Celia is the, is is the in the present tense in America, and is like this is the kind of American interaction. But in a novel that is very much about immigration in some ways, there is very little. As I mentioned in the introduction, there's very little of the kind of like Ryu or Moran adopt, adapting to the U.S. or struggling mm -hmm. in the U.S. as immigrants or su even succeeding. And it, it like it's not along those terms exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to say when you said negative space, there's this like America for a book that's set largely in the U.S. and it's about immigration. America kind of occupies a sort of negative space where it only flares up in a few moments. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit too. Yes, I. You know, it's interesting because like oftentimes. I guess when I go out to talk, people do ask me if I consider myself an immigrant writer, which is a hard question for me because I can say I am an immigrant. I don't know if I write immigrant literature. Part of it is, I, I always think, you know, if I think about my characters or I think about myself, if my characters wake up in the morning, the first thing they look at themselves in the mirror, they don't say, I am an immigrant. They don't say, I am Chinese. They say, I am me. They say, I am my you know, child's mother. I have to cook breakfast for my children. So I think you know, there are so many ways to define a character. But oftentimes, I think we tend to define a character with the big terms, you know, immigrants or you know, with ethnicity, for instance. But I like, to def I like my characters, and I also like myself, to define the people with their immediate connections to other people, so the intimate connections to people. Which is interesting because Celia does not allow any intimacy in this country. And so she does not have that. And which I think allows, I'm not sorry, Celia, Rui does not develop this intimacy. So which allows Celia to imagine all these things, you know, to fill in this blank space for this one character. I don't know if I answered that question. America. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, yeah. it does. I and mean, I think Celia occupies this really interesting yeah. kind of like wanting to do the kind of things we were just talking about, like wanting a little bit easier answer sometimes. Yes, and Celia is the, I mean, someone asked me if I was making fun of American, and I said, no, actress Celia is my, is the most favorite character of mine, because she actually is, she really wants to do certain things, and she's so curious about this outsider. And she even asked Ru, "Are you a North Korean spy?" <laughs> and that's the only time that the Ru in the book laughed. Right. Yes, it's the only time she never smiles, she never laughs, but it's the only time she laughed. And in some ways, Celia is like the the the, the character with the most empathetic energies in certain ways, she and Edwin, whereas we go through much of the book and there's these moments where there's many seeming failures of empathy, where we have characters not responding as kindly or as empathetically as they might, in, like with the mother in the first scene, with like yes. wondering about Shell Eye's um, death and her poisoning and like showing very kind of little concern for her kind of humanity or, or her sons even, and like, uh, so I wonder about that, um, this, this kind of exploration of where sympathies are turned off, in the case of Ryu in particular, but in the other characters too, this maybe solitude is the way you're thinking about it, it's imposed yeah. solitude. You know, I, I think that, like two folds, I think in Ryu's case, her upbringing, she was brought up by, by two grand aunts, who call, the, she called them grand aunts, she was really an orphan adopted by these you know, two old women. 
and they call themselves Catholic. They didn't. E they didn't even understand Catholicism. They made up this whole religion by themselves, and and brought up this child to fulfill that religion. It was a very strange upbringing, and and in a way, I think Celia knew that everything was taken away from her the moment she was orphaned, and but she did not protest. She she got along with that, you know, fate very well. I think. Celia of uh, Ruyu got along with that, and Celia and Edwin, actually the two American, the two American American couple, came in to question that and to want to see the hum humane part of her, but it seems, again, too late for this one character. But if you look at the book, I think it's it's interesting because it's you know it's about a poisoning. I'm always curious about people who use poison. You know, it's a very intimate crime. And it's 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 a cold-hearted crime. It's intimate too, and you have to do all these planning. But in the end, I think Shao Ai, who was poisoned 21 years and lived as a vegetable, and she was the least poisoned character in the novel. And all three children, for 21 years, they have been poisoned by time. And so, in the end, I think their lives have been poisoned by time, and time becomes the biggest poison in the novel. And it's very hard for them to find that antidote to that poison. I, I like the idea that it's a it's an intimate crime. And the other kind of seems like dominant current is like poisoning as a gendered crime. Yes. Um, it's very much as like uh, non-masculine or something. Yes. I'm, like, I'm thinking of like Game of Thrones. Like <laughs> <laughs> poison and poison is like the coward's method of killing oh, really? somebody or something. I didn't um, know that, but I did research on poisoning. It was very interesting. A lot of women use poison, you know, as you said, it's more than men. And also, I mean, women cook. And the food always, you know, poison goes to food. And, and it's, it's interesting. I, I think, and also poisoning is really, I think any murder is, is a crime with a plot. And poisoning is, is, a, is, a, is a murder was the best plot, I would say. <laughs> and it, it seems in keeping with like some of your interests across the novel in, explore, in exploring gender and gender roles and the degree to which the characters kind of push against them and reject them at some times and other times are kind of embrace certain gender roles. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the interest of time, I want to open it up to the audience now if there's questions from the audience. So. Should we include those? Um, and I guess we pass the mic. Pass the mic to that. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience for you? Um, can you share a little bit about what you're working on now? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I write short stories and novels, and I love those formats. And you know, publishers would say stories don't sell. They always like you to work on novels. And, but I'm sort of stubborn in that way that I want to do both. And I did, I did the story collection novel, story collection novels. And then I think the next thing would be a collection of stories. And, and I really actually model that. Like I admire William Trevor, the Irish you know, story writer novelist. And his whole career, if you look at that, is a story, story collection novel, story collection. So I think I just want to follow his lead. <laughs> yes. Um, so I was wondering um, if you ever write in uh, Chinese, and if there is, um, why did you decide to write in English? Right. So the question is, uh, if I ever write in Chinese, and or why do I write in English? I had never written in Chinese, and I grew up in China. I came to this country when I was in my early 20s. And English certainly is not my first language, but English is my first language in writing. And at the moment I started writing, I think it was you know, part of an intuitive decision, a part of it, it's a willful decision that I'm just going to use a new language to become this person. So I just took up English and I really loved English, expressing myself in English. So, so ever since then I think I have not written anything in Chinese. And the other thing, coming back to what you said about negative space, I think when I was younger I 
you know, I did like reading and writing, so I kept a journal. But this, again, this was in China in the early 1980s, 1990s. And my mother is the nosiest person in the world. <laughs> and I knew she was going to read my journal. <laughs> and I knew there was no way to hide from her, except I actually wrote around what I wanted to say. So if there's a if there's a bird here, I would never say there's a bird here. I would say, there's a tree here. There are some clouds around, you know, there. <laughs> so it's a cold, it's a colding. So it's again, it's, a re re it's written by negative space. Whatever I don't say is what I mean to say. Which is very convenient when you take, when you say, you know, you're keeping a journal from your mother. But it's not a good habit when you write fiction. <laughs> and, I, and I think for that reason, I actually think it's impossible for me to write in Chinese. I still have that habit if I do even speak in Chinese to my parents. I go, I go into that automatic model of speaking in negative space. <laughs> Uh, I, I read your first novel, The Vagrants, when it first came out. And I really liked it, and I really was taken with your writing style. Then. But it was totally, it was set totally in China, of course. And but now I see this book is written with a lot of Americans, and you've been here now for 20 years, mm -hmm. I guess. And so do you see yourself evolving into more Asian American. Uh, you mentioned that you don't consider yourself a migrant writer. Mm -hmm. But I, I think what you're expressing here is a lot of the dualities that come with being Asian American. I mean, you're, you know, you're right. kind of stuck in two different cultures. And so do you see yourself evolving into doing more of that type writing where you're going to be talking about the, big, the very variables about being Chinese and, and American? Yes, my involvement. That's a very good question. I think, yeah, I, the vagrants partly said completely in China was 1978. Nobody could leave that town. Everybody was trapped. And to me, I think today's world is interesting is the world actually is becoming smaller. You know, you get onto the airplane, tomorrow you'll be in Beijing, or you, you know, tomorrow you'll be in Dubai. And everybody is moving around, and people are moving around much more than before. The world is coming together a little more, and there are more clashes. And so I think I have lived in this country for probably, yeah, nearly 20 years, 18 years. And one thing I noticed that I actually, I wouldn't say I have the experience of being a Chinese American or Asian American because I still have that, you know, mindset that I come from elsewhere. But because I'm raising children in this country, I actually, I am starting to understand what it means to be a, you know, Chinese American or or Asian American growing up from you know in this society, so I feel that I start to understand America and through my children, you know, I'm growing up with them and I learned a lot from their experience. Uh, how do you feel China depicts How do I feel about it? Do you mean the novels translated or like novels written uh, by? Generally, novels written by uh, people with Chinese ancestors. Right, right. I I would say you know if I if you look at Hajin's work or if you look at my work and a few other writers, we do write about small people. I I like to write about common people, and you know there's no you know, empress in my novel, for instance. I think they are oftentimes just people who are struggling in in the society. And is it a is it a you know a picture that the, like portrays China objectively? I think there's it's always everybody's interpretation. So I went to give a talk a few years ago, it was in twenty two thousand eight and and 
in Virginia, and there was this woman who came to me. She was a very young woman from China, and she said, she said, I really like your stories, except, you know, I don't like that you're not presenting China as beautifully as I want you to do. Why don't you write about the 2008 Olympic? And <laughs> I, I, I explained to her, I said, you know, that is exactly one aspect of China, and someone would write about that, but I cannot, that's not my China, and I cannot portray it, I cannot. And I also can't write, you know, on order, I said. So, so it's, it's interesting because oftentimes people think, you know, like writers like me who either have, you know, come from China or who have, you know, Chinese connection, we, por we portray China, you know, harshly. But if actually you read Chinese literature written in Chinese, they're much harsher. They're, they're much harsher on everything. But as long as they're not translated, I think the government will be fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's someone here, yes. So the vagrants took place in 1978 and started with one ex execution of one political prisoner and ended with another execution of another woman who was a political prisoner. And in the middle, there was a protest against the execution. It was a very political background. The reason I wrote that novel was actually I was very curious about the whole community and and the community was not political. The community was, they, they lived their lives as, you know, everybody, as everywhere a community lived their lives. But when this execution was dropped in the middle of this community, people had to react. And, and their, their reactions were very, very complex than just, you know, black and white, evil or good. For instance, there was this doctor who did the surgery on the woman before her execution. So their organ was taken out. So the surgeon, he did not like to do that. I mean, in my novel, he did not like to do that. But he did that so that his wife could get a promotion in the hospital. I think people do, you know, bargain for these things in any society. People, you know, he could talk, talk himself into doing that, you know, feeling very ashamed, extremely guilty about this thing, but people still do certain things because of we're human, not because we're heroes. So I was very curious about the whole community, of course. And it's interesting you ask about Tiananmen Square, because this year is the 25th anniversary of Tiananmen Square. And around June, I got a lot of phone calls and, and, and you know people wanted to asked me for my experience and I declined a lot of invitations or interviews for the reason I think Tiananmen Square, the whole protest was a very complicated event. It was not just, you know, it was not just bloodshed on the one day, on one night. And if you look at the six weeks, the, the students' protesters were corrupted. The students' leaders some of them were extremely corrupted, just like the Communist Party. And I think all these things, I was curious, because, because we're human, these students could not avoid making the same mistakes or being the same people as the communist leaders were. And, and I, the, the story I like to tell, which could not be told anywhere in any interview, my, my sister was in medical school at the time. So there was this hunger strike 
in Beijing, and she would go with all her classmates to go help out for medical help. And we were not well off a family, and 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 my father was a very well, my father was a hoarder, so anything coming into the house, he would never get rid of it. So, so my sister got a new, brand new sun hat for me from the square, which was donated to the students protesters. And my sister knew that I liked the sun hat. So she brought this sun hat back to me. And of course I liked it so much. And the hat, I don't know if anyone is from Beijing, it's in the shape of, it's in the shape of what Jane Eyre wore back in the Victorian time. So the hat in Beijing was called Jane Eyre's hat. And I got this Jane Eyre's hat, and of course after the crash down, my, 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 bro, my father got rid of the hat because he knew that hat would be a evidence of my sister's you know, participation in the you know, anti-communist event. And those are the things I think we don't get to hear in the newspapers, and we don't get to hear. And those are human stories, and I like those stories. So, so I, so that's why I said I'm not a political writer. I'm, but I'm curious about people's lives during this time. There's a hand before, behind you. Yes. Um, so to say I, my characters, I mean, I write the characters I don't understand. So oftentimes it's people I don't understand and I want to understand them and I am baffled by them. And so as you said, all the characters in Kinder Than Solitude, they all start from my not understanding them. And the whole writing process is for me to find a way to understand them better. And do I understand them like completely at the end of the novel? Actually, I don't either. And I think that's that's the I think that's why I write fiction and I read fiction is actually we never get to know a person a hundred percent. And writing fiction, reading fiction, is really a way to get closer to that. But you're still not there. You're never going to be there. <laughs> well, I think that's the perfect place for us to end. Thanks so much for coming out. Uh, there are books for sale in the back. Uh, I think we have uh, both your new novel and your latest short story collection, so please uh, buy Yi and Lee's books. Uh, she'll sign them here. Uh, thanks to Yi and Lee and to Lawrence Ben Davis. Uh, we hope to see you again sometime soon. Take care. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.